So I got you here with a great marketing title, <laughs> How Cliff Almost Died. The real talk, and I'm gonna tell you that story, so it isn't a bait and switch situation, but the real story is how to grow the container of who you are as the most important thing in your life. Now that title isn't as marketing friendly, so I figured I'd wait till I got you here to tell you that's what I'm really talking about today. That what we do is we get stuck in who we think we are. This is who I am, man. This is who I am, just accept me for who I am, man. And that's our small, smaller self talking all the time. That our larger self, our infinite nature, is the one that allows us to continue to grow, to grow and grow. These pots in front of you here, these are the seeds you planted at Easter in those really tiny pots. Somewhere along the way when they were starting to grow, Margot mentioned, you know, if they stay in these pots, they're never gonna survive. They need a bigger container to become the full dreams that they are. So I replanted them into bigger pots. And they grew to what they are now. So I hope you'll take time at the end of this service to come on up and take a look at your dreams because they are popping. We're gonna put them outside, out in front after today. But it's the bigger container that allowed them to grow the bigger roots they needed to grow who they are. And that's how we are. If we get stuck in the smallness of who we are, we don't get to grow. And if we don't get to grow, we don't get to see our dreams materialize to the extent that they could. Or we struggle like crazy to get there. If you are struggling to succeed, you have not grown your container. This became so incredibly important in the journey that I took these past two weeks. Now I've told you guys a story how 25, what are 27 years I guess is now, I was in the hospital where they gave me five days to live and obviously I survived and one of the promises I made was I would never see a Western doctor again. Who I am is Eastern medicine. And that became very successful for me for a very long time I went through. I healed ulcerative colitis, I healed, uh, went through pneumonia, flus, all kinds of stuff and did it all with Eastern medicine. I got up here and I decided it was time to grow my container. So I went and got a family doctor. Started looking into Western medicine again because I wanted to not get stuck. If I'm gonna to preach to you guys about growing your container, growing who you are, it's you know, important to me that I be doing that too. And thank God I did because I would not be standing in front of you today if I had held to what I thought was so. Now, as we grow on container, as we become who we came here to be, new and exciting people show up in your life as you continue to grow. That's why I got to have a wife who stood by me solid as a rock through what has been an extraordinary two weeks. That that wouldn't, you know, that that made a huge difference in how all this turned out. So, Here's what happened, the way, from my point of view. I wanna tell you, give you a couple of disclaimers to start. You're gonna be hearing some TMI, <laughs> because to get this story through and to get it clear, I'm gonna to have to tell you some things that probably you wish you didn't know. <laughs> so just be prepared for that <laughs> as this story goes along. So I taught the first class 
on Wednesday, that Wednesday, a couple weeks ago, of my Zen class, went home that night, normal night, we went to bed. Somewhere around midnight, I woke up shivering like crazy. Had a fever. Now, who I was for almost 40 years now is the person that when I have a fever, instead of taking a Tylenol or, or any of those things, is I throw a bunch of blankets on myself, even heat myself up more, burn out whatever's going on within two days, and that's how I have gotten rid of flus and colds and all that stuff, like, boom. So that's what I did. You know, we threw on a whole bunch of blankets on me Wednesday night, and Thursday came along and my fever was actually higher. And maybe you've been in a situation where it kind of looked like something else, something you're familiar with, and so how you behaved with it was familiar, right? You did what you always do. Am I the only one? <laughs> right? Not yet knowing that it's actually not that thing you think it is. And I didn't. So I kept the blankets on through Thursday, Friday comes along and things aren't getting any better. And so being that I want to grow my container, we called the doctor. And we went and sealed the doctor. The doctor was like, no, I think it's just the flu. But we'll send you for some blood tests just to see. So I went and I got blood tests. Blood test results came back really fast. You guys are really good about that up here in Canada. And so uh, the doctor called that later that day and said, hey, those blood tests look a little off. Why don't you come back in on Monday? He didn't seem very, you know, like urgent about the whole thing. So I was like, okay. My fever started hitting 102.8. So I started taking Tylenol, which only brought it down to 101. It didn't kill it. We still didn't really know what was going on. And then we got to Saturday. By Saturday, I was feeling real bad. And every time the Tylenol wore off, that, my fever shot up to like a 103, 103.2. It was getting bad. And Ash started, and Ash, who was clear as day, goes, her higher self, her intuition goes, I'm getting the word sepsis. What do you think about that? And my intuition doesn't work that way. My higher self doesn't work that way. Mine works on directions. Tells me what to do. Right? So I didn't know what to make of it. Maybe, maybe not. Day went on a little bit longer. She came to me and goes, I think we should go to the hospital. And my first response was no. Because I hadn't gotten that yes from my higher self yet. A couple hours later, she comes back and goes, we really ought to go to the hospital. And then the strangest thing happened. What came out of my mouth with no thinking at all was not yet. And that was really interesting for me. Not yet. But it let me know that my higher self, my soul's intention, my intuition, that was the voice. It was there through all the shivering, through all the pain I was going through, through all the uh, lying there in bed, having trouble getting out of bed. It was this voice that had said something that just didn't make any sense at all and that's how I knew it was the voice. <laughs> Not yet. And then a little while later, Ash comes back and goes, we really need to go to the hospital. And I got the yes. And I've been thinking about that. And I've been thinking about everything that happened after that, step by step by step, and how it fell into place, and how it might have been completely different if we'd gone earlier the people who helped us, the situation, even the hospital we landed at. Because when the ambulance arrived and we asked them what hospital they were taking me to, they said they didn't know until I'm in the back of the hospital. I mean, until I'm in the back of the ambulance. 
that that had to happen first. And so I might have wound up at a different hospital. The whole situation might have gone differently than what it did. So I trust in my timing. I trust. Now here's, and you know, go back, going back to growing the container, I have never ridden in a hospital, in an ambulance. I have, you know, and, and even if I've gone to the emergency room, I've either driven myself or had somebody take me. So this was a new experience again, growing my container, constantly, going, okay, who am I now? I'm a guy who's gonna now be picked up, put into the back of an ambulance. Okay, why would I get in the way? And yet, sometimes we do, right? Sometimes when we're in situations that we consider serious, that's when we hang on to who we think we are the most. And yet I knew the most interesting part of this whole thing is I never once, not once, prayed for my, to get better, to get healthy. Not once. Instead, I kept my focus on who I was being. Who before what? I kept it there. I said, who am I being? I am infinite nature. I am infinite nature, which means I am health. I don't have to pray for health. I don't have to pray to get healthy. I am that. And I just kept reminding myself of that over and over and over. And that I am, since I'm infinite nature, I am not stuck in who I think I am. I get to be whatever is necessary for this to unfold perfectly. And I was at complete peace the whole time. I never got scared, not once. Which shocked the heck out of me. Because the last time I was in the hospital, I was scared up the yin-yang. But here I am 25 years later having put all this principle to work and I was calm as silk. So we get to the emergency room and you know, they wheel me in in this bed, which is great, Gurney. So I'm not having to sit there while they're figuring out what to do with me next. And they bring me to a section of the, after they take blood and they start running tests and do some other things, start an IV and all that kind of stuff. They wheel me over to this place that is an in-between emergency room ICU area. The hospital I was in was Royal Alexander. That turned out to be really important. I didn't know it at the time. But that's, and, and when, because I actually asked to go to the university hospital. They said, no, they're busy. We gotta take you to this one. Turned out to be perfect. So while I'm sitting in this ICU section, these two doctors come up to me and they say, we think you're a good candidate for the ICU. And I'm, really? (laughs) Okay. But they say, if you come up to the ICU, you gotta have a catheter. Now, Here I am having to grow myself again. (laughs) Because that was the last thing I was interested in at that moment. (laughs) And so when they put the catheter in, something went wrong. Not only did it hurt to go in, but every time I passed water. How many here have had kidney stones? The pain of a kidney stone before it passes is one of the most excruciating pains on the planet. Am I right for those who know that pain? I experience that pain every 20 minutes for 10 to 15 to 20 seconds. It was excruciating. And at first, I'm screaming. I'm just screaming, I'm like, this is unbelievable, you've gotta do something about this, take it out, and they're like, no, you can't come up to ICU without this, we're sorry, we'll give you some drugs. 
So they gave me some drugs, didn't touch the pain, didn't touch it. Every 20, 30 minutes, I'm just like, oh my God. And then I'm thinking to myself, Zen. Zen. I'm teaching this class. This is a really good time to put this kind of thing to work. So I start just being with it. Instead of trying to fight it, instead of trying to resist it, instead of trying to run from it, I even tried hypnotizing myself. I tried all these different, you know, I've been in this movement a long time and learned all these different techniques. None of them were working, right? So in the end, it was just being with the pain, just allowing it. This is it. This is what's happening every 20 minutes, over and over and over. And it wasn't as if the pain went away, but somehow I was able to know that I could be with it. I could get through this. This wasn't gonna kill me. Took me up to ICU, hooked me up to all these different machines, all the flashing lights. They start giving me all these drugs. And all the time, Ash is right there with me, going through, standing right by me, you know, right there. And the cool part was how calm she was. And even with all the pain, I'm still not afraid. I'm still not scared. I'm still at peace, which felt great. And so the doctors are coming in, they're trying this, they're trying that. You know, they, they confirm that Ash was right, it was sepsis. But with the added complication that somehow the infection had also moved to my lungs, which were filling up with water rather quickly. And so I was, it was getting harder and harder and harder to breathe. At some point, they moved me to a different quieter room with a bed. Not a bed, but a uh, fold-out something or other, and Ash was able to sleep on that, so she was actually able to stay with me in the room. And they, you know, my, blood, my white blood cell count was over 20, um, and the scariest part for them was that my oxygen levels were dropping. They had me on 100% oxygen, and it was not getting into my lungs. So Monday, around noon, they told me they were gonna have to ventilate me. And I said, no. I said, this is where I draw the line. Ash, who I've been talking to about this for at least a decade, said to the doctor, well, so I said that to the uh, respirator technician. She runs out. She's freaking out. Doctor comes in about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And he sits down and he says, your oxygen level is at 65%. At 60%, you're dead. You better let us ventilate you. I said, no. They started to cry a little bit, explaining how wonderful my life has been, how if this is really the end, I'm gonna get, go home with my wife, sit in my backyard and die. But that I was really okay. You guys get to do what you want for this last 5%, but if it hits 60, I'm out of here. He said, you'll never make it home, and I said, I'll bet I do. So that was the turning point. And something happened at that point. All of a sudden, the doctor got it. His face changed. Where he accepted what I was telling him. And in that moment, 
all of a sudden, behind him, it went pure white. The room disappeared. It was just white light all behind him. And he changed. And I was in the bed looking at him going, oh my God, this is the face of God. This is what it looks like at the door. I couldn't believe it. It was astounding. It's like nothing I've ever seen before in my life. It didn't last long, you know, a few moments, I don't know. But then all of a sudden something shifted. And I was back in the room and everybody had changed. It turns out that at that particular time, in that particular hospital, was the most foremost infectious disease doctor in your country, who was running five different studies in the ICU. Every one of those studies ended with the words, when ventilated. So their anticipation was that I would be ventilated. And when I said no, I threw off everything that they were ready for and moving forward towards. And so they went into an entire different gear because this was unexpected for them. All of a sudden they started experimenting. I mean, things just started moving at a much higher level, at a much higher pace because I had said this is the way we're playing this game. And so they started on doing what they're doing. Now I'm still experiencing every 20 minutes this excruciating pain. But I realized that I needed to do my part in this game too. The game was get my oxygen up because that was the thing that could kill me the fastest at this point. And so I started, after all these years of meditation and everything I've done, I started watching my breath. I got really deep in there with it. I was watching it really closely, going in and out, very shallow, and, and watching the, where it was getting blocked, how it was not entering my lungs. And at some point, I got it. I saw it. I actually saw the edges where my breath was getting stuck. And from there, I started working on a breathing technique that would work around it. And so I started working with my breath. I'm lying there in bed. And at first, and I'm counting to want to know how deep a breath I'm getting able to take in. And at first it was like three. That was it. But I kept at it because now I could see it. I could see how to work my breath around these jagged edges. And then I got to four. And then I got to five. When I got to six, the respirator lady came in and said, you're doing so well, we're going to back off your oxygen from 100% to 90%. I kept at it. I got to seven. I got to eight. By the time I got to nine, she came back in and said, we're going to back it off to 80% now because you're taking in 85 to 90% oxygen now. I kept at it. 10, 11, 12. It's now about dawn. I'm doing all this while I'm still every 20 minutes having to deal with that pain and they backed it off to 70%. Now I was no longer at that gate. Now I was back in. 
They said, you're not out of the woods, but at least the oxygen piece isn't going to kill you now. Now, they'd been doing stuff all night long too, so I'm really clear it wasn't just me, right? But I am clear that we all work together. That somehow the exact time I went had the exact people on duty who reacted exactly the way they did at the exact time they did so that by dawn on Tuesday, I was not any longer at that gate of death. I wasn't healed, but I wasn't dying. It was extraordinary. I never lost faith. I I stood my ground through all of it, and Ash stood right there with me. It was remarkable. That's as far as I can get in the story this week. You're going to have to come back next week for part two. (laughs) There's a lot more miracles that happened after that. (laughs) But all of it happened because I kept focused on my infinite nature. Because I kept focused on the one thing that really mattered is not that I am going to get healthy, but that I actually am that. This teaching is extraordinary when you practice it, when you put it to work. I can't wait to next week to tell you what happened next. (laughs) Because it was also extraordinary. Thank you for sharing this journey with me. I am so beyond moved and humbled by my life. Humbled by what happened. Humbled by you being here. Come up and see what happens when you open your container. Take this in. The most important thing you can do with your life is keep expanding who you are. Because everything else will take care of itself as long as you keep doing that. My wife and I, we are so dead set in our intuition, that higher self, it shows up in ways that are just miraculous. You get to live a miraculous life, an awestruck life, where even in your darkest hour, it can become miraculous. Look forward to telling you the rest next week. Thank you, I love you.